just so everyone knows we're recording this and everyone will get a copy of it afterwards as well. So that's why we're recording. So um, we started. All right, Ellie, I'll let you I'll let you get started. Well, great. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to have you here today. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ellie Larrabee, and I'm the Children's Cro Crisis Program Specialist for Children's Behavioral Health here in Maine. And I have two wonderful people that have uh, graciously agreed to come and share some information with you about uh, a program that I am so excited about, so excited to bring this information and this curriculum to Maine. Uh, first, I'm going to introduce you uh, very quickly, going to let him do his own little introduction, is uh, Mike Antis. He is the program uh, developer for, sorry, director for YTRI and Christian Moore, who is the, um, actually the founder of YTRI. Um, I promise it's going to be exciting information. You're going to be sitting back going, really? Like I did? Uh, towards the end of our presentation, we're going to have time for questions. Any questions you have, please drop them in the chat. We're going to be monitoring that. And we're also going to be sharing some opportunities for some training on the actual curriculum. So with that, Mike, I'm going to let you take the reins and, and start us off. Hey, thanks, Ellie. I appreciate that. I appreciate all you're doing. And um, and I'm excited for this this training today that we're providing um, to to give you some insight and resilience and and so I'll and and I I'm program director for Why Try I've I've worked as a school social worker for 18 years helped implement Why Try um, I've used it individually implemented on a school level so um, I found it as 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 a great tool and I'm happy to be able to to work for Why Try now and be able to share that message with with districts across the country. So, um, but what I, I want to um, introduce to you my, my actually my, my boss, but my friend and my mentor, Christian Moore. Uh, Christian's an internationally renowned keynote speaker. He is a licensed clinical social worker. And I think really most importantly, an advocate for youth. Uh, he's the author of the book, The Resilience Breakthrough. Uh, he's the founder, as Ellie said, he's the founder of the Why Try program and why try program is in over 30,000 schools across the country it's impacted millions of kids and why try as you're going to learn in the next hour is a program uh, and an approach that helps educators teachers administrators um, teach kids the skills of resilience and build a resilient mindset so with that I'm going to turn it over to you Christian all right. Well, it's nice to be with you guys here this afternoon. Uh, I'm a big fan of Maine. In my travels, I've had the opportunity to go there many times. It's one of the most beautiful states. Uh, I remember the first time going there, I was 12 years old and went with a youth group up there. And um, we went fishing and the our supervisor up there on the way home, his car broke down. So one of my claims to fame, I've literally driven from Maine to Maryland at 30 miles an hour on the side of the road. Uh, our advisor, it's back in the 70s, I guess you could do that, or really on the freeway down the side, you know, on the side. And uh, I guess he didn't have the money to get the car fixed. So um, that, uh, that was the longest trip of my life. So I did learn some resilience. The irony is, you know, I, I wrote this book on resilience and, and that was my uh, most resilient car ride. I'll never forget, I remember, it was we're coming down the coast. I saw New York City for the first time, you know, from the freeway. And just kind of remember that taking my breath away. And I also have to give, you know, I'm a huge LL Bean fan. So I got to pay my respect. That's why I learned customer service. So to this day, everything I know about customer service, I learned from the um, great state of Maine. And so the the people there are amazing, amazing people. So um I'm excited to talk to you guys today about my favorite topic, resilience. As you can see, I had to learn resilience um, really early in life. You know, people always say to me, what's the number one thing a person has to have to be resilient? I wrote this book, The Resilience Breakthrough, and, you know, very few people read the book all the way through, but they want to know, you know, what's the most important thing to be resilient? And you know, a lot of thoughts go through my mind, but to be really frank with you, I tell people now, the number one thing you have to have to be resilient, if resilience is the ability to bounce back you have to have something to bounce back from. You have to have suffering. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through a little bit of a model of resilience and share a little bit of why try with you. But the first step of that model is is suffering. You have to have, you know, 
some type of difficulty or opposition. And we know that's the human condition. All of us deal with some type of difficulty, some type of um, suffering. So to just illustrate that, I want to start out with a, a quick video clip to illustrate that, that human condition of suffering here. All right. So I'm talking to you guys from the Rocky Mountains right now. And um, I think we're getting like four to six feet of snow today in the um, in the mountains. So ho hopefully you guys have some good weather there in Maine. But I, I'm with you. And uh, Mike is from North Dakota. So, man, we, we're representing all the um, cold weather parts of the U.S. today. Um, so I want to start off by taking you guys on my own resilience journey a little bit. I grew up not here in the Rocky Mountains. I grew up in between D.C. and Baltimore. Grew up in a family of 12 kids, five brothers, six sisters. Both my parents had some mental health issues. My dad was autistic, was a code breaker at, at NSA, the National Security Agency. And my mom had a fear of leaving the house. And for years, I would tell the story. One day, my therapist is like, hey, Chris, you know, you tell your life story over and over. You live that trauma over and over again. You should probably put that in a um, video version of it. So here's a, a quick short version of, of of my life story and how that led to um to resilience pull that up here i grew up in between baltimore and dc in a family of 12 kids five brothers six sisters both my parents had some mental health challenges my mom has social phobia generalized anxiety disorder had a fear of leaving that house okay. you have to leave the house when you get food there wasn't a lot of food to eat sometimes in my house growing up. Don't tell anyone, but my dad was one of the highest level code breakers of the National Security Agency. You could give my dad any mathematical problem and he could instantly rattle it off the top of his head. My dad was autistic. He was a genius, but he had very little common sense or social skills. If you've ever seen that movie, A Beautiful Mind, you've met my dad. So having two parents with some mental health challenges, put me in a situation where I ended up being a street kid. I could hang out till two, three o'clock in the morning on a school night, I very few rules, very few boundaries. One night I was out late at night and a car pulls up and I hear a voice. And the voice I hear is the voice of a woman who I endearingly call Mama Jackson. It was one of my best friend's moms who sees me out there, you know, late at night. Christian had so many obstacles that was going on in his home. She knows what I'm out there doing. And she says, look, don't you ever step foot on our property. I'm going to call the school tomorrow. I'm going to make sure you're not in any of Sean's classes. I remember thinking to myself, dang it, I'm bad. I'm not that bad. I can never go to school with him ever again. When you see a child um, that's hungry, there's no happiness there. You're thinking about what other kids have that they don't have. Okay. But when you see a child that's hungry, when you give that child some food, you see that child's disposition change. Going to school was very difficult for me. As a child, I was diagnosed with ADHD, conduct disorder, and severe learning disabilities. When I was sitting in a classroom, oftentimes, you know, I was embarrassed. When I got called out loud, I would act up and get in trouble instead of embarrassing myself because I didn't know how to read or didn't know how to do basic math. So, you know, for me, it was like going to the doctor's office every day, going to school. You know, I had a hard time telling time when I was even 17 years old. I couldn't tell time on a hand clock. To me, a quarter to five equals 25 minutes to five. But they tell me a quarter is 15. But how could a quarter not equal 25? <laughs> When we concentrate on that more, 
to make sure that a child's needs are provided for and that child will thrive. I know that I'm loved and I know that this person is going to feed me to make sure I have what, what I need. Mama Jackson took over and said, look, if you start going to school every day, I want to see your report card. If you start answering to me, you can come eat in our house anytime you want. Now, Mama Jackson was a seriously, seriously good cook. That's one of the reasons why I'm in top physical condition right now. But anyways, I was very blessed to have Mama Jackson come into my life. I was kind of in a formal foster care situation. She took over and really started giving me skills of resilience, had a huge impact on my life. And I'm excited to share with you all the different skills and strategies that Mama Jackson gave me to help me become resilient. One of his teachers in high school said to him, that he would never go to college. Christian went to college. Growing up in between D.C. and Baltimore, I saw many social problems in my community, in my neighborhood. You know, I saw poverty. I saw hopelessness at times. I even saw some violence. But I remember walking to school one morning and literally seeing one of my best friends evicted from his house. His furniture was all throughout his front yard. I could see the heartbreak in his eyes, his parents' eyes. And I knew in that moment, I wanted to be a social worker. And I knew I could not become a social worker unless I went to college. You know, but I was told college was probably not going to be an option for me with a sixth grade math level, a seventh grade reading and writing level. You know, statistically, I had a better chance to play in the NBA and becoming LeBron James. This experience was at the other side of the track. Uh, life was a good book. Life was a unique. And the kids like that, they had to survive. I struggled getting through college math. You know, college math is a requirement to make it through school. I remember that feeling in my stomach where I knew I couldn't graduate. They're not going to let me graduate because I, I can't do math. I can't count money. I can't uh, numbers. I get confused and all of these things. He, he was like a... a uh, a bobcat in a cage. But I came up with something called the no F game plan. And this is a strategy that I use to make it through school with my learning different. He made himself big. He made himself known to others. I'm here. Hey, I may not have what you have, but I have a street smart. I would go to every class. I would sit on the front row. I would do all the homework assignments. And I would do enough extra credit to get a D minus. I would shoot for A's, but I learned in college you get just as much credit with a D minus. And uh, his paper is not polished. Other students get an A. Christian gets B. Sometimes a C. But he has ideas. He has a substance. And the Why Try program that he ran with and the help incredible number of students and the teachers and administrators came out of a classwork. He created an environment uh, to teach teachers how to really deal with students who may have significant functional limitations. I persevered, luckily, I knew what resilience was. I knew how to take my academic challenges and use them as a reason to knock down barriers, to focus on what was right with me, not what was wrong with me. The vision of why I try. And I think this thing is called the roller coaster ride. <laughs> and I'm so glad that when he fell off of that roller coaster, that he got back on. Dr. Virgil Wood, civil rights icon and close friend to Dr. Martin Luther King, learned about why tries impact and decided to honor Mama Jackson with the National Rosa Parks Save the Children Award. Mama Jackson gave me a safe and loving environment so I could thrive. She didn't get rid of my problems at home, at school, in my neighborhood. She showed me how to use those problems as a fuel source to put one foot in front of another and create a productive outcome 
with the opposition. Despite my many challenges, I was able to get a master's degree with a sixth grade math level and a seventh grade reading writing level and become a licensed clinical social worker. As a social worker, I was able to see the challenges that I faced growing up from a completely new perspective. I turned these insights into a program to help students reliably answer the question, why try? In I'm going to cut that a little short because of time. But you can see I have a huge debt to pay with the resources, the mentoring, the people that reached out and helped me. It's inter interesting. When I watch that video, it's a little emotional for me because um, – my blood sugar in that video was 732 days later, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes and I have it completely under control now. And it just, it's interesting to just see the, um, the, the juxtaposition there. So anyways, um, yeah, resilience, as you can see, it has had to be a part of my life, you know, being a child with severe learning disabilities, ADHD, just some of the challenges I had growing up. I, you know, I, I look at what's difference between my life and my own kid's life. You know, I, I had no choice but to learn resilience. I, I live in a nice cul-de-sac in the Rocky Mountains and, you know, my kids have never been outside playing without me having eyes on them or, or another adult. So I probably overcompensated from my own childhood um, quite a bit. But um, a long story short, um, Dr. Seifel, who you saw in the video, one of my college professors comes to me and says, look, Christian, how did you make it this far in school with your background? You heard me talk about that no F game plan. I'd go to every class, sit on the front row, do all the homework assignments. If the teacher said do a 20 page extra credit paper, I would double it. I do a 40 page paper because I learned if I do more work than the person helping me, they would always open up another door for me. And um, so I, I learned that, you know, that hard work would make a, a, a huge, huge difference. And so that, Professor says to me, look, Christian, how are you even on this college campus? So I wrote down a few principles on a piece of paper. I wrote down, I had to stop crashing. Let me pull this up right here. So I just wrote down, I had to stop crashing. I had to realize my decisions had consequences. And you're going to see these now are, are put into visual metaphors. A uh, school counselor one day showed me that 80% of the kids I'm working with are visual learners. I spent eight years in college you know, $65,000. I always say $65,000 because no one gave me a dollar for college. I worked two jobs. My wife worked two jobs. So very proud of um, <laughs> grinding my way through college. And um, this, in you know, this, this social work and this, this, I'm sorry, school counselor says to me, Christian, just how did you do this? How did you make it this far? So I wrote down, you know, these principles on a piece of paper. I, you know, I just wrote down, I had to stop crashing. And she said, hey, these kids are really visual. And um, so to get on that track to opportunity, freedom, self-respect, I had to tear off my labels. I had all these labels right here growing up, you know, um, failure, druggy, learning disabled, dumb, lazy, rebellious, attitude problem, troublemaker. I had to tear off my labels. And I'm, I'm sure many of you work with kids that have different labels out there. And when you have these labels, you know, sometimes it's hard to want to get out of bed, to put effort into life, to, you know, just deal with life stressors when you're walking around carrying these, these labels. So with this one, we partnership with them and helping them tear off the labels. I had to learn how to control my defense mechanisms. When I was in school, the teacher would say, Christian, turn to page 130 and read out loud. I didn't know how to read. So I'd swear at the teacher or punch the kid next to me because I'd much rather be sent to the principal's office for acting out behaviorally than having 30 kids, you know, falling out of their chair laughing at me because I don't know how to read. You know, today I realized why was I doing that? I had no control or my defense mechanisms. Um, is what I call the motivation formula. I look at life's problems being like water. You know, water can flood and do damage. And, you know, they're in the great state of Maine. I know you guys have, have dealt with flooding before. And so, you know, it, we have to drink enough water to stay alive. But again, too much water, we know, you know, can destroy us. So it's, it's kind of this catch too, is our best friend and our, our worst enemy. And here we're showing the, students how to take their challenges and put them through these dams right here. You know, the first dam is the choice to use positive self-talk and we want them to really focus their self-talk on what they control. We want them to tap into character and heart. That means you go through the motions, you don't give up because another person needs you and you need them. And then we want them to tap into a passion, purpose, or interest, and then get plugged into at least three different support systems. And so that's kind of the purpose of that metaphor there. And then this is a tribute to my home state of Maryland. If you put a bunch of live crabs in a pot, you know, I'll say to the kids, you put these crabs in the pot. If you don't put a lid on the pot, why can't the crabs get out? And they'll go, well, duh, the other crabs are reaching out and pulling them down. 
So I'll say, hey, your friends you're skipping school with, you're fighting with, doing drugs with, all the drugs are pulling you down, they're keeping you in the pot. And we all know positive you know, peer support is one of the greatest things in the world. I always tell the kids, if you blink twice, instead of the crabs pulling each other down, they're pushing each other out of the pot as well. And then you can see all the questions that the counselor or the teacher asks the student or the child is written around the visual picture. You know, what are the reasons for staying in the pot? What will my future be like when I get out of the pot? What will my future be like if I don't get out of the pot? And then we have a lot of art activities, music activities that reinforce it. So the student visually sees it, they hear it in music, and then they physically do activities that reinforce it. Or I'll say, hey, draw me a picture. We do a lot of art stuff. I'll say, draw me a picture of what life would be like if you stayed in this pot. Draw me a picture of what life would be like when you get out of this pot. You know, one of the questions there is, you know, what are the reasons for staying in the pot? You know, if I have, you know, if I have no support system, no friends, you know, connections, I might be in a gang. That gang gives me protection. It gives me money. It acts as a surrogate family. And then we just talk to them about, you know, warning, if you try to get out of this pot, you will be attacked. You know, if you try to get out of that pot, people will pull you back in. I don't know about you all, but the more good I try to do in this world, the more you'll be attacked sometimes. Um, I have them write in whatever problem they're dealing with. And then we just walk them through a simple problem solving model. They have to identify the problem. They have to create options, get help, take action. And my fifth one, the fifth one there is my favorite. It says, believe in change. On a scale from one to 10, circle where you are and believe in the change will happen. One, I can't change. Five, maybe. Six, I know I have the strength. If the child says anything below a five, I kind of slow everything down and make sure they believe change is possible. And I always say to them, look, the one thing you can count on is change. You know, I'm doing some work recently with some children that are suicidal and I'm helping them understand if you can just hang in there, the one thing about this world for sure is change is going to show up. Nothing stays the same over time. I promise you. So I find that a really powerful, powerful strategy sometimes when I'm dealing with suicidal issues. And then number six is jump back up. You know, if I trip, how will jumping back up make me stronger? You know, what do we learn from the, from messing up? You know, I talked about what makes us human is the fact that we mess up, we make mistakes. And, you know, one of the things that's really important with um, being resilient is to forgive ourselves. Kind of the kryptonite to resilience is if we mess up, if we make a mistake, if we don't give ourselves grace first, you have less desire to jump back up and get up over that hurdle. We got to give ourselves that 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 forgiveness. And so anyways, we just a simple problem solving model right there. Um it's kind of interesting. This is a maze. It takes them like 20 minutes to get through this maze as a special ed student. I sat in class drawing mazes all the time. And um, it's funny, years later, I've drawn hundreds of these mazes, probably even a thousand of these mazes. Someone took a ruler several years ago and said, Christian, you have the exact distance between each line in the maze, like almost like a machine. Because I sat there in school for you know years just drawing these mazes. It was probably... It was something about my OCD or something. But anyways, it takes them like 20 minutes to get through this maze. I'll say, to get through this maze, you had to have the desire to do it. You had to put the time in. You have to put the effort in. The other day, I was speaking to 2,000 students. I said, what would take you further in life, hard work or being smart? And the 2,000 kids are like, hey, being smart, Mr. Moore, being smart will take me further in America than hard work. And I spent the next hour and a half teaching them, actually, in America, hard work will take you much further than just academic smarts. But these kids many times have been socialized the opposite of that. Um, so as that's the focus on desire, time, and effort there. And then um, they have to lift society's laws and rules. You know, to talk to children about laws and rules are usually pretty, you know, frustrated by that. They push back tremendously. So I'll say to them, what are all the laws and rules you hate? And I'll write them all down on the back of the paper, all the rules and laws they can't stand. And then I'll turn the paper back over and I'll say, have you ever lifted weights before? They'll go, yeah. I go, when well, you're pushing up on the weight, what's the weight doing? They're like, well, it does. It's going up. And I'll go, yeah, yeah. As it's going up, it's also coming back down, right? And you're pushing against it. And every time you push against it, it tears the cells. It tears the fibers in your muscle. Then those fibers rebuild and they get stronger and stronger. And I'll say, hey, look, your weight, your resistance are all these laws and rules. The balloon represents skipping school, fighting, running away, doing drugs, hurting yourself, hurting other people. There's no resistance from that balloon. At the end of the hour, I'll say to the child, you know, what does this picture teach? And they'll say, man, the reason why I'm failing, 
the reason why, you know, I'm in this group home or being kicked out of this class or whatever the situation is, um, is because I'm not lifting that weight. And I've never had a child argue with me about this picture. The first couple of years I was a therapist, you know, I would talk to them about, hey, you got to follow laws and rules. It was like pulling teeth. But when I started teaching this principle here, it's just a true principle. They get it. They're like, all right, uh, man, my resistance, that weight are these rules. I have to lift these rules. And I, you know, as a child, I was diagnosed with conduct disorder. I can't stand rules, but I also know that there's a billion dollar industry that will lock me up for the rest of my life if I don't follow these rules. And so I just kind of have a frank conversation with them. Hey, this is the reality of life. You got to lift that resistance. It's no different than how we build muscle, how we thrive in anything. You got to lift that weight. And then again, each one of these pictures is reinforced with music and physical activities. You know, we teach these pictures basically all the way down from, you know, K to 12th grade. We have elementary versions and Mike will share with you some of that for the younger kids. We have a secondary version. And um, so my, my claim to fame, I like to share, we actually teach this from the play pen to the state pen, K through, through death row. We've taught this in over 200 prisons. So this is actually taught literally um, K through death row. And the reason why we're able to teach this even through corrections and mental health and in all these different settings and education is if they learn visually, we teach them visually. If we learn auditory, we teach them auditory, body kinesthetic, however they learn. I spent eight years in college, you know, learning how to just primarily do verbal cognitive talk intervention with these kids. I'm, I'm trained as an art therapist, a play therapist and stuff, but I thought, okay, is there a way to take evidence-based mental health and deliver it in a um, delivery system is more relevant to these to these students. So in, in Y Try, we have what we call three R's. The first R is the relationship. The second R is we want to make sure it's relevant. And that's why we do everything in a multimedia kind of delivery system. This current generation is spending eight to 12 hours a day engaged with media, eight to 12 hours a day. And so that's where that relevancy comes in. We want to make sure what we're doing you know, grabs this kid is relevant to them. And then the third R is resilience, which I'll go into more depth here in just a few minutes. But um, the next picture here, they've got to get plugged into the support system. When we first work with children, they usually have one or less of these. So our goal is they get plugged into at least three of these, a parent or caregiver, a positive friend, a teacher, counselor, school official, a positive mentor, or something that inspires or motivates them to do good. You know, one of the only good things that's come from COVID is we just did a worldwide study on the importance of relationships and, and the debate is over. We saw what happened throughout the world when people are isolated, when they're dealing with loneliness, we saw anxiety go up, depression go up. Um, we know in the United States, we're dealing with a pretty intense you know, mental health crisis. I was reading some articles even this morning, they were talking about ways you know, in many states, it's sometimes a three to six month waiting list to get in to a therapist. And they're trying to do innovative things to enable more people to have access to evidence-based mental health. Um, but again, that debate is over. For years, people would say that's coming from a bleeding heart social worker saying that relationships are the X factor. Again, because of this worldwide study, that debate will never happen again. We know we're social creatures and we know it is the biggest X factor. Um, and then the last picture sums it up. When we first work with many children, they're standing right here next to this wall. They're dealing with failure, maybe drugs, different family problems, academic problems, you know, feelings of I can't or feel like shut down. You know, they don't know the answer to the question, why try? And we believe the answer to the question, why try is if you try in life, you'll have more opportunity, more freedom, more self-respect. You know, 26 years ago, when I started asking literally thousands of kids, what's the answer to the question, why try? Many of them would say to me, I don't know. I just shrug their shoulders. I don't know, Mr. Moore. So I thought, okay, at the end of the day, I'm going to make sure every child I work with knows that if they try in life, they'll have more opportunity. They'll have more freedom. They'll have more self-respect. But we got to put that in a language that's relevant to them. And as I said a few minutes ago, this current generation spending eight to 12 hours a day engaged with media, you know, their, their phones, their iPhones, all that media, they have incredible access to it. So we have to make sure what we're doing, one is in a language that captures them, that's relevant to them. And, um, and then my goal is to teach skills of resilience as they're, you know, going through these, these skills. So what I've shared with you thus far with these 10 visual pictures 
These are skills of resilience. And what I want to do is spend the rest of the time talking about where resilience comes from internally. And real quick, before I do that, I just want to give you one sample here. Let me pull this up here of the music that goes with Why to Try. So um, there's a study from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. They have found that listening to music is students' number one non-school related activity. And when I saw that data, I said, okay, if that's their number one <laughs> activity where they're spending almost more time engaged, I just saw that um, they were... They were talking about the number of downloads of songs. It was like three trillion songs were downloaded last year. It was insane um, uh, numbers. And I, I think one in 27 of those songs were by Taylor Swift. So if there's any Swifties out there, I'm with you. No, I'm kidding. But, um, <laughs> but here's um, a song that goes with, um, I can't believe I mentioned Taylor Swift in a presentation. I think that's the first time I've ever done that. But um <laughs> So here's a song that goes with tearing off labels. Imagine you've been carrying labels your whole life, and now you're listening to this song right here. And if anybody out there likes this music, that's not good. That means that some of the kids won't like it. We got to make sure what we're doing is relevant to these to the kids. And by the way, when I started using music to reinforce these visual metaphors, court ordered kids started coming to counseling an hour early because they wanted to hear the next song. Then with the next visual metaphor, and that's when we knew we had something that was reaching these kids that was relevant to these children. Okay, here's the song. I'm gonna do. Um, actually, I'm gonna do tearing off labels here. Let me play a little bit of that song for you. I'm not hearing the sound, Christian, come through. I don't know if we need to switch. Sound not coming through. Yeah, I'm not hearing the sound. Yeah, sound, sound's not coming through. I, no, I'm not hearing it. Sorry. No, hearing it. Well, I'm going to go ahead and sing it for you. It's kind of a <laughs> hip hop song. Uh, <laughs> talks about how to um, tear off those labels. I am not sure. So what I'm going to do is, so as you can see, there's lyrics that go with the music. And then we have discussion questions that tie into the lyrics. So the child visually sees it. They hear it in music. And a lot of it, you know, we use everything from rock and roll to hip hop to all kinds of music. If kids only listen to country music, I'll usually play rap hip hop for them. If they only listen to rap hip hop, then I'll play country music for them. And I'll explain to them, usually what we hate is what we don't, don't understand or we, what we have not been exposed to. You know, being a white child who spent quite a bit of time being raised in an African-American home, I learned really early in life you, the root causes of... Um, of hate usually and it's usually a lack of exposure and um that's been my lived experience I, i've gone seven million miles around the planet and that's has been something i've observed over and over again we, we usually attack what is less familiar to us um let me pull up right here let me go so again so why try is skills of resilience and we put over 3 million students through these skills of resilience and then literally thousands of counselors educators started saying to me hey christian kids get your 10 visual metaphors they get the music they like your art activities your music activities what well, we totally get what you're doing but here's the problem why do some kids take these skills and thrive with them and other children don't and that was the toughest question i got over the last you know 26 years and one day i decided all right I'm going to start paying attention to the a population I rarely work with. Most mental health workers don't work with this population. These are people with high trauma that are thriving. I was doing work from Detroit to Baltimore to Los Angeles. You know, I was working in all 50 states. And so I started paying attention. I remember meeting some kids in Baltimore whose you know, dad was an alcoholic, mom was in prison, and this group of these kids, one, two of them were brothers, had like full ride scholarships to John Hopkins. And it hit me one day. I'm like, I'm going to start paying attention to people with high trauma that are thriving. Again, most social workers like me, we, we don't work with people with high trauma that are thriving. We work with people with high trauma who tend to be hurting themselves and others or shutting down, dealing with major anxiety, depression. And I said, wait a minute, I'm going to start really focusing on this population. And we kept seeing four things pop up over and over again. And now we've shared these things with literally tens of thousands of children. That's where resilience comes from internally. That's why I wrote the book, 
the resilience breakthrough. I just found out from our publisher, Greenleaf, um, there's over a hundred thousand copies of that book in print. I would never have believed it in, in a million years. And um, so it's come from my background. When I was 17 years old. I didn't know how to read. And so I, I can't wait to run into my English teacher and tell her I, I have a book now. Anyways, um, and that, by the way, what I'm doing right there is a type of resilience called street resilience is <laughs> where you use any type of judgment or disrespect as a reason to put one foot in front of another. So um, let me just pull up this picture real quick. What I started realizing is, you know, all human beings have somewhere between 40 to 60,000 different emotions during the day. And some of those emotions are going to be positive, And some of those emotions are going to be negative emotions, right? So, you know, positive emotions would be things like optimism, you know, happiness, trust. I didn't grow up with a lot of those emotions right there. You know, I had something called reactive attachment disorder. Both my parents had mental health issues. It was kind of a informal foster care situation where mama Jackson came into my life. And then my ninth grade year, I spray painted my name on a water tower, got busted for doing artwork. A little side note, I actually make a living today combining art and mental health, but I, I was decided on a water tower to share my artwork with the world. And the next thing I know, they shipped me out to the Rocky mountains, 2000 miles away to be rehabilitated. And, um, and so what I started realizing was, look, if I was going to make it in this world, I spent most of my time on planet Earth with those emotions there on the right, with pain, fear, sadness, anxiety. I've had anxiety disorder my whole life. A little side note, by the way, when I speak to like 2,000 people, I'll say, you know, raise your hand if you woke up this morning and you were feeling dread or anxiety. In education, about 60% of educators will raise their hand when I ask that question. So if you're dealing with anxiety, Welcome to most of America is dealing with anxiety. So you're as normal as can be. And so what I started realizing was you actually, it's like a car battery. If you can maximize both your positive and negative emotions, you have twice the fuel source to bounce back. And when I was working with people with high trauma and high suffering, they tend to have negative emotions. So pretty early in my career, I started realizing, hey, if I can't show people how to create a productive outcome, with their negative emotions, we're not going to get that far in the change process. The challenge was I spent eight years in college, $65,000 only being trained in positive psychology, right? That's the main thing I learned in, in graduate school. But when I started studying people with high trauma, I remember I was reading lots of biographies. I'll just use these people's names because they happen to be famous. But I remember reading Christopher Reeve's biography. Everybody knows the story of Christopher Reeves, played Superman. Um, he was the opposite of me, tall, dark, handsome, talented, this Renaissance guy. He gets thrown off a horse. He's paralyzed. You know, he's this great actor, mountain climber. And um, he says to his wife after he's paralyzed, hey, I can't fight on. You know, I feel like giving up in life. And she says, look, Christopher, just stay alive for me, for the kids. If you still feel like this in a few months, we'll relook really at it. But you can see what she's doing. She's just trying to buy time to keep Christopher alive. And everybody knows the rest of the story. He took his anger, his sadness, his hurt, and he channeled it into his rehab, you know, in the pool, it made a huge difference. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela took 27 years of being in the prison camp. Victor Frankl, I started realizing when I started reading all these books and then working with kids and families with high trauma, all of them were starting to create a productive outcome with their negative emotions. And if you think about it, you're actually at a resilience disadvantage. If you have to wait for positive emotions to show up before you put one foot in front of another, you're actually at a massive disadvantage. And again, you have twice the fuel source to bounce back if you can maximize both your positive and negative emotions. Now, it's one thing to tell a child, hey, I want you to maximize your positive and negative emotions, but they have to have that internal motivation to do that. And that's where the four sources of resilience come into. And this is what I wrote my book about, um, The Resilience Breakthrough, is, again, when we looked at people with high trauma that were thriving, all of them talked about these four things. And the first thing we saw was something called relational resilience. And there's an incredible amount of data behind this. Is It's just that you go through the motions, you don't give up because another person needs you and you need them. These are my two kids, Cooper and Carson. You know, if I never got invited to speak again, it's funny, I said that for years and then COVID hit and essentially went out of business during COVID because, you know, I'm a consultant, right? And couldn't get on an airplane and all this webinar stuff hadn't taken off yet. And I'm like, oh my goodness. This but I didn't go on shutdown because they needed me I needed them, and we can literally look at data and say, okay, 
if you have a support system of three or more people that need you and you need them, you're way less likely to give up, to shut down. And so um, the more people that are depending on me, it's not inter independent, it's that it's, it's positive support for one another. Um, I can depend on others. My greatest power comes from human connection. You know, Mama Jackson was that relationship for me. You know, one of my favorite examples of um, relational resilience is Harriet Tubman. We know she freed over 200 slaves on the Underground Railroad. When the slaves would want to turn back around, you know, she, they would hear the dogs coming towards them in the woods. They would see the lights coming towards them. And many of the slaves would want to turn back around. When I went to her museum a couple of years ago, I explained the real story. She actually had a shotgun and she had explained to them, if you turn back around, we're all going to get captured. And so when they saw her shotgun, they tended not to turn around and she didn't lose one slave on the Underground Railroad. You know, why did she go to that extreme? It's because she understood at what level she was dependent on them and they were dependent on her. She's also the grandmother of my profession, social work. Jane Adams is the mother of social work who started the whole houses in Chicago, but she did some of the first organized social work. She did um, some social work in Philadelphia um, where she retired for, and she helped retired elderly and created some of the first um, retirement homes for African-Americans in, in Philadelphia. Um, but anyways, that's what relational resilience is, is all about. One of my favorite examples is, Rick and Dick Hoyt, who ran over 240 triathlons together. And he says when he became the legs for his son, it completely transformed his, his life. If I had more time, I'd show you a little video clip there. But um, I'm going to get to the next place that resilience comes from internally, which I've already alluded to is the street resilience. So our goal is we don't get rid of the child's emotions. We show them how to create a productive outcome, whether the emotion is positive or negative. Because we, everything I've been taught in social work is start where the child is. And we've got to make sure, and it's like the weight of the world comes off their shoulders when they know how to create a productive outcome, whether the emotion is positive or negative. The other thing that's really powerful about that is they realize there's nothing wrong with them. It's as normal as breathing to feel sad, to feel hurt, to feel angry. That's the human condition. Everybody experiences those emotions. And you just have a massive advantage if you know how to create a, a productive outcome with those negative emotions. And so the second place that resilience comes from internally is street resilience. And that's where you use any type of disrespect, um, past mistakes, injustices as a reason not to give up. You know, I was told I couldn't go to college because of my learning differences. A professor came to me and said, Christian, if you can get a college degree, my degree is worth less. I literally walked off that college campus in tears. About nine years later, I was in two college textbooks as evidence-based RTI, PBIS. The professor had to actually lecture on my theories. They might say, Christian, you're bragging. You're being cocky or whatever. No, I'm not. I'm being street resilient. You told me I'm not even good enough to be on this college campus. Now I'm in the college textbooks. I have value. I had value before that. And so when we started looking at literally thousands of kids that had I trauma, all of them talked about having to prove people wrong, having to knock down barriers. There was always people judging them. The ability to use hate and judgment as a fuel source and not use it, you know, hate plus hate equals more hate. The ability to not go down that road to say, I'm going to rise above the judgment. I'm going to rise above the hate, discriminate, whatever the issue is. The ability to use that gives you a massive advantage. And we kept seeing that pop up over and over again. I was just talking two days ago to a um, young lady that was suicidal, and we literally identified all the negativity, all the people that were judging her, and and some of the, she had been bullied really bad, and that was leading to some of her suicide ideation. And we literally talked about, okay, one, we don't have any control over what those people are doing. Two, the only way you can beat that is to use that pain Use that judgment to prove them wrong, but you got to do it out of love for yourself and um, knock on wood. She's doing, she's pretty stable right now, but her motivator every morning is to use that judgment, to use that bullying, to use that disrespect, to not take her life. And she understands it. She internalizes it. She called me yesterday and said, Christian, all right, I'm, I'm tapping into that street resilience. And she was on fire, you know, to be able to take that disrespect and do something great with it. That and not, 
use it in any way to harm someone else. You know, sometimes we tend to, as humans, is you hurt me, so I'm justified in hurting you back. And the ability not to do that is one of the most powerful things I know I've ever been taught on planet Earth. Um, you know, Rosa Parks, powerful, powerful example of street resilience when she refused to sit uh, on the back of the bus. Um, you know, Nelson Mandela in the prison camp for 27 years. My favorite story about Mandela is the prosecuting attorney that seek the death penalty against Mandela. Mandela, you know, becomes the president of South Africa, invites this guy, remember this guy seek the death penalty against him, invites him to his house, gives him the nicest food, sits down and has this wonderful meal with him and says, look, I know I messed up. I made mistakes. I learned from those mistakes. I'm going to create reconciliation here in South Africa. You know, he connects with the guy. They have this great conversation. When the guy leaves, the national media is there in South Africa. And they say to him, what do you think of Mandela now? This is a direct quote from the prosecuting attorney seeking the death penalty. He said, he's the most saintly man I've ever met. That's the power of street resilience is to use judgment, hate, disrespect as a reason to become greater, to work harder, to prove people wrong. It's a powerful, powerful place that resilience is born. And then I'm going to just highlight the last two really quick is something called, um, I have a picture here of Michael Jordan getting cut from the JV basketball team. There's Malala, powerful, powerful example, shot by the Taliban. She said, until the man who shot me, until his daughter can receive an education, I'm going to speak out. We know she got the Nobel Peace Prize. But anyways, the next place that resilience comes from internally is something called resource resilience. And that's where you maximize your talents, your abilities, your resources. You know, growing up, I only had two skills. I could talk nonstop. So they sent me to the principal's office every five minutes for talking nonstop. Maryland had corporal punishment. So they would beat me with a wood paddle for my nonstop speaking, right? So I could talk nonstop. And I could draw really good. So I did graffiti, you know, growing up. And then they shipped me out here to the Rocky Mountains, you know, for doing that. So I, I actually make a living today with the only two skills I had. I could talk nonstop and I'm a good artist. So I combined art and mental health and I continue to talk nonstop. And I've gone 7 million miles around the planet talking nonstop. The principal should have put the paddle down and explained to me the greatest resource I had was the ability to communicate instead of beating me for my ability to communicate. I'm going to get therapy one day. Don't worry. But um, so resource resilience, again, is just tap into the resources and systems available to us. And today, you know, the most valuable asset I have, and it's funny, you know, I was, I was the least academic person on the planet, but today the most valuable resource I have is knowledge, is education, is, is information. That is by far, we know the biggest thing that can change this planet is access to information. And, you know, you know, I can use and develop my talents, my personality traits, my work ethic, I can feel gratitude, all these things. You know, Helen Keller, powerful, powerful example of resource resilience. You know, my favorite example, one of them is Kyle Maynard. He was born with no arms, no legs, and literally crawled through the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. If you haven't had a chance to see his story, look up Kyle Maynard. Amazing story of just maximizing the resources that he has. Now, resilience takes place in the effort effect. It's the striving all any of us can do is be as resilient as possible with the amount of money we do or do not have in the bank, who our bosses or challenge our kids are having, our car might have just broke down or whatever the economic or the different challenges we're having. Resilience takes place in the striving. I've never reached resilience. Resilience, I'm supposed to be this expert on resilience. I'm telling you, I've never reached resilience. It takes place in the effort effect, in the drive. And then the last place resilience comes from is something called rock bottom resilience. And that's in your lowest moment, you flip that switch. You say to yourself, how do I use this problem as a resource? How do I use this problem as my best friend? It's kind of a gateway to resilience. And, you know, all of us have our own personal rock bottom moment. The ability to use that rock bottom moment as a resource gives us a huge advantage. So the first thing you have to have to be resilient is you have to have something to bounce back from. The key ingredient to resilient is suffering. The second thing you have to do is, is ask yourself, how do I use that suffering as a resource? And then we want them to maximize both their positive and negative emotions. And then what's going to motivate us to do that is we've got to tap into relational resilience, resource resilience, and um, street resilience, and then rock bottom resilience, those four sources 
of resilience. So that's a Reader's Digest version of all this. I'm going to turn the time over to Mike and feel free in the chat to express any feelings or ask questions about anything. And me and Mike can stay on for a few extra minutes and answer any questions, but I'm going to have him give you a, a quick overview of what we're doing here. I want to thank you guys for devoting your lives to this work, to reaching so many children like myself. You guys are my heroes. Um, there's no more important time. We have a mental health crisis going on right now in this country. There's no more important time to be involved in this work than right now. So thank you for, for being in the fight. You guys are my heroes. Thanks, Christian. I appreciate it. Always a great message. And um, uh, um, I wanted to follow up with the chat. I didn't realize, I apologize. The chat actually was not enabled through most of this. So if you're trying to put something in, it is now. If you want to put in some questions, um, uh, it, it's working. So thank you again, Christian. Uh, uh, always a great, like I said, a great message. Um, I learn something every time I listen to you. And this time I learned you're actually a Taylor Swift fan. So that's pretty awesome. Awesome to learn. All right. Okay. So um, I'm going to go through in the next, we've only got a few minutes. We're, we're, we'll hang on longer. If you can stay and have questions, we'll hang out for that. But what I want to do is take all of this, this powerful message that Christian just shared with you. And I want to then give you just a, a, a look into it, the tools that you can use to take that, those message and those lessons and begin to use it in your work with kids. Um, let me just share here real quick. Um, so again, why try? You know, we've talked about uh, why try and what our message is. And that, and so, and really, I, I want to talk about that. Like, really, it's a program, it's a curriculum, and it's approach. Um, and part of that approach, I want to highlight a couple of the unique things about it is that visual approach. Christian just went through all the metaphors, and and the key to that metaphor is that it helps us build really um, um, a language to communicate these abstract concepts in a way that kids will understand. The the Why Try program itself uses a multi-sensory approach. So all those keys that Christian talked about, using music, using journals, using activities, using videos, um, help create the engagement, right? So I, we, we really have what we call the three R's. And, and the first R is really relation. And I don't know if you've ever had a student that would work for you, wouldn't work for other kids, um, uh, or whether teachers in the building, sorry, if that student, the reason that student worked for you was that relationship, right? Relation equals motivation. If we can have relevance and we, and we present a curriculum in a way that's relevant to kids, that relevance is really the why of it, right? So if we can take that, that motivation and give them and help them understand the why, then we can increase the resilience, right? The whole kind of overview of what the tools and the kid are designed to help you do. And again, I just threw you, Christian went through those skills, talked about them, you know, through reality ride labels. Um, and I think really these are the 10 skills we're working at helping them with decision making, positive self esteem, emotional regulation, right? How do you handle your defense mechanisms, having a resilient mindset, peer influence relationships, problem solving, hard work determination, responsibility, relationship building, and ultimately self efficacy, right? Being able to see over that wall. The challenges are there, right? But if we can help have the tools to teach the kids these skills, they'll be able to climb that wall and have a better view. Um, so I wanna go through in the toolkit itself, what I'm gonna show you are pictures. The toolkit's a digital toolkit and it has all these resources built in it. The digital toolkit um, has the metaphors that you can download, right? We've talked about the metaphors. Christian mentioned that we've got it through elementary um, and secondary. I just wanted to put up some of the metaphors. There are lessons designed um, for grades, and we have them grade banded at elementary, uh, pre-built lessons, grade one and two, grade three and four, grade five and six, and then we've got our, uh, really our secondary, there's a pre-built secondary scope, 18 week scope and sequence of, of lessons that incorporate all these tools that are pre-built and ready to go. Um, but you see, we have the metaphors, um, we actually have 40 metaphors to teach the same, the concepts, those 10 concepts I showed you are, are really 10 learning units. And we've got literally like hundreds of ways to put those together into lessons. Um, and so the next part, one of the pieces of it that we look at was learning activities, getting movement, getting engagement, um, and, and teaching object lessons in a way that, again, is, it gets, gets engagement. There's excitement to it. You can see in the toolkit, there it, 
you can you can pick the lesson. Um, you can sort it by grade level and time. It will give you instructions on how to do it. But the key really is the processing ex questions. Like we, these lessons, these activities, kids are going to love. They're going to have fun. Um, your students will engage in it. But where we see that paradigm shift is when we process and ask questions. Christian talked about music. We have uh, curated music lists of songs that um, that will you can use um, to help model the skill, help have discussions of the skill, use it as uh, to really set the mood of beginning um, your your lesson. You can weave them into the lessons as cues to change up, bring them back from activities. Um, it's just such a powerful engagement tool. Um, and then we have our music that we've created uh, that Christian talked a little bit about. Hey, Mike, hold up. I'm going to, I need yeah. you to add some Taylor Swift to that, by the way. I'll be quiet. All right. <laughs> we'll put it on. It'll be on there next time. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I was disappointed you didn't sing the song for us. I was going to, I would have provided a beat for you. It would have been awesome. Um, <laughs> so we'll save that for next time too. Anyway, um, the uh, uh, videos, the short videos uh, are awesome. Again, modeling the social skills, discussing the social skills. It's a way to increase engagement, which increases learning. Um, and I know as someone who's, who's really worked presented this to kids it's so nice not to have to just rely on on just my sparkling personality i know i'm coming in with lots of tools that are going to be engaging and exciting that kids are going to want to participate in um and so and i i know christian you showed a, just a, a bit of this um rick and decoy i just an example of a video and i think it's it with one video we can teach skills um in this in this lesson and of course it's father son um, um, that ultimately the triathlons, marathons work together and that can create so many discussions around those skills, right? Just one short video you could use to talk about labels and the labels that he had as a kid. You can talk about the relationship that they had and really how they had to plug in. Uh, obviously, hard work, determination, resilient mindset. There's so many things that can come out of that. Um, the kid also provides journaling. Writing is, is kids outlet, some engagement for a lot of kids. Uh, so we have journal prompts that would, would help with that. Also, um, sometimes writing, isn't it? It's art, it's drawing, it's looking at pictures. So we've got, there's art, boost, there's art boosters as well. And so you, you click in, you can download them, they're PDFs. Uh, and then we also have a curated list of books and they're all, all of these activities that I've just listed, all these resources um, are tied to the skill that you're teaching. So as you go in and put together a lesson, you're going to be able to pull up and say, I want to start with this activity. I'm going to, we're going to work on this skill. So I'm going to use this metaphor today. I'm going to put in a music activity. So that's one of the uniqueness. And I think a real strength of, of having these tools and kind of putting Christian's work in action is that's flexible. Um, it can meet your needs as you present. So I am, um, and I know we've got a large group of folks, not just in education. We've got folks from that agencies that serve students in a multitude of ways. So when I, I wanted to show kind of how it can be, how you can take this in, in a flexible way and put it together. But really, if you're working one on one with kids going into homes, um, if you're visiting them in school or if you're a counselor, a social worker, administrator, getting that office discipline referral, you can use this in a one on one walk through it. I used to have all the metaphors printed sitting on my desk. And whenever that kid came to me, whatever the issue was, I could pull out a metaphor. We could walk through it in a few minutes and I could really have an impact. It also gave them something physical to take with them. Um, sometimes they throw it in the garbage on the way out, which is okay. I have plenty of them. We'll come back and have that discussion again, but it gave me an evidence-based way to teach and not just process those situations. So lots of great opportunity in one-on-one. -on -one. Small groups, really ideal for small groups. You've got uh, group activities. Again, you can structure the lessons given your time frame. And, and I think small groups, a lot of times schools will look at their data and they might have groups working on attendance groups for maybe particular behavioral issues, groups for mental health support. This provides you a curriculum and a way to walk through uh, and teach the skills that are gonna help students be the best version of themselves. Um, again, in classroom, it can be a classroom curriculum. Sometimes um, classrooms may just have uh, need to have the counselor push in and co-teach with the teacher and walk through these programs to help learn some skills that they need to help with that classroom management. Sometimes it can be a particular class, maybe a freshman class at risk as kids are transitioning to high school, but it can become part of that classroom curriculum. You can use it on a school-wide basis 
and um, as an as a tier one implementation, it works well. And because of the flexibility of how you put the lessons together, um, I'm going to pause just a sec here, make make sure there's no questions in there. And, um, but I, I do want to mention training is key, and that's kind of what we're talking about. And that's where I have Elliot and Narissa here uh, to kind of talk. A, I mean, we have an opportunity for you to participate in training. And the training part of this really covers, again, this is right from the toolkit. This third column here, facilitator competencies, the training goes over the units and all the resources, how to use them. But the key to doing, um, to, to putting this into practice well is to understand Surrender the one up is relationship, right? I think we don't want students to feel one down. We want to be able to help them feel one up. How to use questions and processing, how to frame these lessons, how to facilitate the activities, how to use those videos, right? What that looks like. And we want to make sure kids' attention span isn't that great. We want to keep them engaged. So how we kind of use multiple activities, right? How we put them together to keep them engaged in the lesson. Again, using, using music and resilient listening. That's the training that is provided and once you do the training you then you then you have access you become a facil, uh, certified trainer and you have access to use the curriculum and that's really how we provide the curriculum to different schools and agencies that we work with and so um implementation is part of the discussion to think about whether like i said if you're in an agency um uh, daycare a whatever it is and 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 there's there's a way to to put it in place but one of the key things to think about within your organization is how you implement um, I want to, I just wanted to add this really quick. I know we've got some administrators here, um, and I know I'm just a bit over time, but I just wanted to say, again, we have a, a program that kind of helps take these principles and give leadership teams and schools the ability to teach these skills to their staff. And I don't, and I'm talking about understanding the relationship skills, building relationship, doing surrendering the one up. Really, it's, it's about, um, helping to improve that, uh, overall foundation of relationship that helps SEL. So I'm going to go just in a little bit further here. And Mike, I was going to say one thing real fast. I just want to encourage everybody yeah. to grab that QR code because we have a free parenting guide thing we can give you on resilience. There's lots of resources we can um, send to you if you yeah grab that QR code because we got and, good stuff for you. Yeah. And actually what I'm going to do, this code we set up. Now this is a little bit different just because of an opportunity that the Office of Child and Family Services, right? Children Behavioral Health Division is offering. What they're doing, this QR code is to some trainings coming up and it will allow you to register at no, uh, you can register for the training and really at no cost to you. It's gonna, it's, it's, and there's a limited number of spots. So please check it out. We've got trainings over the next few months. You can, this is open to really anyone that works with children. So if you are in a school system and you think this might be helpful, talk to your colleagues, get them involved. If you're in a, um, an agency, the same, this is where you can go to. So that QR link is there. Um, we'll go ahead and try and I think even upload those links into our chat. So we have them. You will get a copy of this. We're recording this presentation. You'll get a copy of it afterwards um, that will have these QR codes as well. But this code is really for the upcoming trainings. We've got two in January, one in February, one in April. And hey, so- Mike, I'm going to- I'm going to also throw in a free copy, uh, a digital copy of the Resilience Break. I know the, awesome. the I like it. state of Maine has been through a lot already in the last few months and this year. So I want to throw in um, my book for free, an <laughs> electronic copy. And don't, don't tell any other place that. But yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do that just because I don't know. I'm in a good mood today. I, I, I love the people there. I love. Uh, and plus, I, I just want to get to L.L. Bean and fish in their pond one of these days. There you so, go. There you go. Uh, Okay, I'm gonna come. I'm gonna come back to have two QR codes. I do. There's one. We have a March training that's specific to um, the offices of Children and Family Services that we want to connect. And I want to double check, Ellie Nurse. I'm right with that, right? That's the March one that we have set up for them. Yep, I see the nods. So this is the code. If you're in there now, don't if if you're not a part of that that agency, don't don't register for this one. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and I'll put um, both codes up. You can see the main residents. If you work with kids, that's the code that will get you to a landing page where you can engage. Now, some folks with Windows computers, Windows 10 and 11, have run into issues with their code and getting checked on. If you go through your phone, put it on your phone, it'll go smoothly. If you happen to run into it, you'll have my contact information as well as a part of this. Just reach out to me and I can get you manually registered for them. Um, I'm going to turn it, Ellie and Nerissa, do you have anything else to add? 
I would just also let folks know to reach out to me if you have questions at all. Uh, I, Mike and I talk on a regular basis. And I am so thankful for you folks coming here today. I love the fact that we're looking at meeting children where they're at and helping them understand, even though things have happened, you, you are resilient and, and life can look differently. So I, I really appreciate that. Awesome. All right. Well, and I, I, I just want to thank you, Ellie Larrabee, Narissa Siemens. You guys have been amazing to work with. What you're doing for the state of Maine is incredible. Um, and not just this, but all the work that you do to support the mental and behavioral health kids. And Christian, thank you again. I, um, I, I appreciate all that you do and, 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 and sharing the book. So we'll, we'll, we'll click that mm -hmm. in with, uh, with the links um as you get the the uh the video a copy of the video today we'll add uh the copy of the book with that as well so perfect. mike i do have a couple of questions in the chat one right. is asking about a certificate of attendance for today um yes we can put a certificate of attendance together and get that out we'll send it out to everyone who was on and the other is from a child care provider asking about using these tools and concepts for for kiddos who are under the age of six? That's a great conversation and a great question. I, I know you guys have asked about that before. It's really designed for that elementary level. That's that's what it's evidence-based for. That's what it's worked for. Some folks have just kind of adopted it and adapted, but I just want you to be aware that it really is, is designed for that. The concepts work uh, with that pre-K level, and we are working on um, actually having that model expanded to that, but that's still something that isn't, isn't quite available yet, but, but, but that's a yeah, great We actually question. have people in our office this week working on that to get it to the end. Cause I actually keynoted for the whole country last year, the, um, you know, pre-K national conference there. I was a speaker at and, um, and yeah, we're getting that request a lot. So we're working on that. We should hopefully here in the, even the next few months have something around that for you know down to like three-year-olds even so we're, we're realizing and we're creating activities you know a lot of that's going to be activity and art based and stuff so we're working on that right now so we're, we're hearing that all across the country and we know we got to get that intervention as early as possible so thank you for that inquiry but yeah it's very adaptable you'll see once you see our lesson plans they're pretty simple lesson plans they're very clear um you know, one thing I'm proud of is everything we do, again, because a child visually sees it, they hear it in music, they physically do it. It's it's very easy to adapt the skills to younger kids. Someone's just commenting that they work with youth at risk between the ages of 11 and 18, and that they're really seeing that this is going to be a, a good opportunity for them to to get some tools for their toolkit to, to work with that population. Yeah, and by the way, I want to say, you know, the state of Maine is, providing the opportunity to be trained and access this. It's it's incredible what they're doing in that state. So please take advantage of those training. And you said the training dates, right? You'll put, you'll send those out, I guess. I don't know if you said them or not. Um, yeah, I we didn't exactly. We have on our oh, list as well. Um, they, I know that there some, for example, the Department of Education actually has it on their website. Um, so, uh, but yes, we can, um, I think, Narissa, you can drop those in the chat even. Yeah, those dates. yeah, to take advantage of that, that's a great deal. All right. Any other questions, Ellie, that you're seeing? I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Awesome. Nerissa's right. dropping in uh, those uh, links to the training with the dates. Perfect, okay. perfect. Well, with that, everyone, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Christian and Mike, for, for meeting with us and, and giving us that overview. I'm always saying I'm so excited about this, so <laughs> I still am. Perfect. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great Thank day. You.